Mark 15, actually it's Mark 13, 14, 15. I'm gonna give a quick scan on this. Why? I, I love to pull text together. It, it gives it that much more strength. And in Mark 13, 14, and 15, what I'm seeing here is it, it's, it's Jesus' last teachings. We look at Jesus' last words from the cross. There's seven statements that he makes, and it's important to understand his, his last statements, the, those seven things that he says from the cross. And everything that he says from the cross was, is so valuable to us and for our personal growth. Here it's his last teachings. And what he's teaching here is specifically for the disciples, for us, the church, in these last three chapters. And he's focusing in on the idea of faith, hope, love. Faith is what you think. It's, your, it's, it's what's going on in your head. Hope is your actions. Love is your communications, how you respond to other people. And in chapter 13, it was apathy. Apathy kills faith. Apathy is a lack of interest in the scriptures. You know, I don't need it. It's, you know, I, okay, I'll read the Bible once in a while. But you cannot become apathetic. Arrogance was chapter 14 last week. Arrogance is unwarranted pride. That kills hope. And what we saw was the disciples were struggling with arrogance. They were thinking, well, they were asking the question, who's greater of, of, of all of us? And Jesus is saying, it's the servant that is greater. Quit trying to be up there. You know, uh, he says, you're going to scatter. And, and Peter says, not a chance. I'm not going to scatter. I know you say some things, but I don't, you know, I'm not going to scatter. And everybody joined in with Peter. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times besides scattering. And there's Peter. Now, not a chance. That's an arrogant attitude. Because arrogance is, I'm the most important thing, right? And Jesus is trying to get that out of them. And then the last one that kills love is mockery. Mockery is to hold to contempt, to hold up to contempt, to treat somebody with total contempt, to laugh at them, is to build yourself up and put them down. Now, all three of these sins have a root and the root comes from the word to foo and it's translated in our bibles conceit now you need to write this down because this word to foo in the greek only has three places and it's used it's paul talking to timothy and the the insightful one because it's uh first timothy 3 6 6 4 and second timothy 3 4 but this word, when you look at the translations, is the number one word used for arrogance, conceit, vanity. And that's the sin of the devil. And that's really interesting to look at. So that's what he's saying in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 6. Yes. Actually, verse 5, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And he, the, the elder can't be a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. That was the devil's problem, conceited. The devil's problem was arrogant. God created the angels before he created the world. God created the angels to be his servants, to, to, to serve us. Angels are greater than us in, in power and all of that. They're, they're up in heaven, but they constantly behold the face of the Father, someplace in Matthew chapter 18, maybe around verse 3, waiting for instructions from God, permission from God to come down to be with us. Well, Satan was conceited. Satan was arrogant, and he thought he was totally above man and who why is god telling me to serve man i refuse to serve man and that was his arrogance as a matter of fact he wasn't going to serve us he was going to destroy us and it's interesting how just after that it's cain that says i am not my brother's keeper 
people in the world have that arrogance that I am not going to serve other people. And that is something, that's the seed for disaster. Because when you have that arrogant attitude that you are better than, then apathy is, is the next thing, right? It's easy to be apathetic. Like, I'm sorry, why am I studying the Bible? I know more. And I already know I'm a Christian, so I don't need to read the Bible anymore. I'm, you know, apathetic. Arrogance? Well, that's the sin that Jesus was trying to expose for the disciples, right? Because they were had that arrogant attitude, because they were trying to be more, they were trying to be better than the others. I mean, there's James and John coming to him and saying, We want to be on your right and on your left. We want to be better than. Unwarranted pride kills your hope because it will not get you, allow you to do things. And then mockery, right? Which is what we're looking at today. Mockery is definitely to look down on people because they are to be treated with contempt. You need to be arrogant to be a mocker. And that mockery is going to kill love. Because you absolutely have no love for other people. Oh, I might love these guys. When people see you're a mocker, they know that you mock them. Right? It, it just comes with the territory. It, it's hypocrisy. A mocker has no love for people that are less than or less fortunate than. And all three of those is, is the problem that Satan had. This thing called arrogance. And I don't want to camp on the negative, but understand that's, so I want to find something that's positive, something that's a three that encourages us and fits in with the text. And I didn't have to look far. I mean, Keon was teaching us this not too long ago, book of Joshua. Joshua pulls it all together. And what you need to see is this is Jesus' last three major teachings, chapter 13, right? Don't be apathetic, chapter 14. Don't be arrogant, chapter 15. Get away from mockery, right? And what we see in Joshua, he's, he gives God, Christ, gives Joshua three sound pieces of advice that fit with what Jesus is doing. He's giving us three sound pieces of advice. Beginning with verse 5 of chapter 1 of Joshua. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Christ lives within us. We have the Holy Spirit. God has not abandoned us. We have his word. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all, all the law. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your, now catch this, it shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, and you shall so that you may be careful to do according to what is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. You want to be successful in this world? You want to be prosperous? Well, the first thing that he's, he's saying here that I need to focus in on, it's not the first thing, because he, he hits us with strong and courageous. But, but then he goes to, you got to have the word of God here in your mind. Which takes me to Mark chapter 13. What's Jesus saying? Be careful of the apathy. You need to be what? You need to be alert. And so the positive teaching that Jesus is saying there is disciples need to be alert. Christians, the disciples were first called Christians in Acts, what, chapter 11 someplace, right? Down in Antioch. If you're a Christian, then you have to be a disciple. I don't think you could be a Christian and, and not be a disciple. And a disciple means a student. And Jesus is the master. And if you're a disciple, you are very much alert. 
Apathy is not in your vocabulary. You have to focus on the word of God. That's Mark chapter 13. That's the lesson that Jesus is saying. Be a disciple. And then in Mark chapter 14, don't fo focus on the arrogance. But the illustration that we had was Mary, who had humility for this super rich woman to be able to come into the leper's home and to pour a year's supply, a year's worth of this incredible perfume on Jesus' hair so that wherever he went for the remainder of the week, all you could smell was this beautiful, incredible nard preparing his body for his death. She knew what was going on. And to get away from that arrogance, you have to have humility. Now, arrogance is, humility is opposite to arrogance. To be humble, now catch this, to be humble is to have a consciousness, a consciousness of one's defects and shortcomings. You've got to look at yourself and say, these are my weaknesses, right? The strongest a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You got to know your weaknesses. To be strong is to know your weaknesses. Second Corinthians is, the, is this massive lesson that Paul's teaching us in Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through verse 10. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul's just, he's getting goosebumps all the time. He's just getting insights to the Old Testament and he's just sharing that all the time. He's just totally excited. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself, to what? To humble me. This is this weakness that Paul's got. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power, power is, strength is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's the strength that he's saying. Joshua, be strong. Know your weaknesses and let God do the work. And when you're letting God do it, when you learn to humble yourself, now you're strong. If you think you can do it, you're going to mess up every time. Every time. Don't give people advice. Show them scripture. They'll come up with their own solutions. When they come up with their own solutions, they'll put it to work. But when you give them solutions, when you give them advice and you tell people what to do, they won't do it. And if they do, they'll blame you because they failed. They need to identify their weakness and then give it to Christ. That's, the, that's your strength right there. And that's what he's trying to teach in Mark chapter 14. Don't run with who you think you are. Listen to me. I told you, you're going to deny me three times. Accept that fact and do what? Well, when they were in the garden, he said, what? Pray. Pray. Give it to God. It's what you got to do. And now where are we? Mark chapter 15. And with Mark chapter 15, with this mockery, I, I could not find what? I, I could not find the opposite, the antonym. And when I look it up in, in the thesaurus, it said, the opposite, the antonym of mockery is to be genuine, to be authentic, to be natural. And to me, that wasn't what I think that Jesus was telling me to do. Be genuine. Not in the face of mockery. But with Joshua, he said, be courageous. Stand up and be courageous in the face of mockery. Absolutely. So Jesus in Mark chapter 13, taught the disciples to be alert, be a disciple, be on the ball, get into the word. That's your thinking, that's your faith, right? And then in Mark chapter 14, be humble. 
the more humble you are, the stronger you are. And you need to understand that the stronger you are because you have Christ doing the work through you, not you yourself. And here in mockery, he demonstrates. And that's how uh, I'm just going to quickly look at this chapter because I'm screaming through the time right here. But what you need to see that Jesus is doing here is demonstrating courage. Because these guys are just coming down on him, right? And to be courageous, I wrote in my notes, is to say only what needs to be said, but to say it. You know, it's what we learned in Revelation to the seven letters to the seven churches. Jesus is telling them exactly what they need to hear. What's it called? Tough love. People need to hear the truth. That's courage. And so what do we have here? Well, I mean, it, it starts back in, in, in Mark chapter 14. The high priest is, is, is totally mocking Jesus. You know, what is this? These guys are testifying and you're not saying anything. Well, how do you say anything when it comes to mockery? False accusations. What, what, what can you say to false accusations? So finally, he says, are you the Christ? And Jesus says, that's it. I am. It's all he needed to say, really. Right? And then that's all they wanted to hear. And then they're dragging him off. Early in the morning, chapter 15. Early in the morning. Why? Because you need to get this trial done. You need to have him executed before the rest of the, the city wakes up to the reality of what's going on. Or we're having a riot on our hands. Early in the morning, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, what do they do? They have a consultation. Oh, what an ugly word. We're going to consult. We're going to, you know. I looked that word up, and it's translated three other times in the scriptures. Conspired. Like they're having a conspiracy right here. We're running this guy down to Pilate, and we're going to get him taken care of, right? So they conspired and off they, they, they took Christ. Pilate questions him, are you the king of the Jews? That's mockery if you've ever heard it. The, 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 the Romans know there's never gonna be a king of the Jews. Like this is a joke. And the Romans have incredible disdain for the Jews, right? And Jesus is just gonna say all he needs to say. And that is you say, and that's all Jesus responds. And then they're, they're accusing him harshly. And, and Pilate is amazed because he says, you know, you don't say anything. And, and listen to all these charges. And Jesus doesn't say anything to him, right? Because that's courage. Learning to say only what needs to be said in the moment. Because when people are mocking you, if you start to fight back in defense, they're going to mock you more. Have the courage right so actually jesus i should have mentioned this gives us three lessons on how to take mocking how to get through mocking verse 1 through verse 15 what's he demonstrating he's demonstrating that you need to learn to accept it that's it understand they're going to mock you okay accept it and the word accept here means to tolerate something undesired look he didn't want to go through this you don't want to be mocked, ridiculed, accept it. It's going to happen. Don't fight it. Okay? So that's what we see here. And then Pilate's looking at the crowd. Yeah, should I set free this king of the Jews? And, and they're going, no, no, right? Uh, give us Barabbas. Barabbas. Barabbas is a murderer. Give us anybody but. Give us the worst you've got. But we don't want this man set free. We want you to crucify. And they kept screaming, crucify, crucify. Talk about mocking. What do you want me to do with King of the Jews? Wishing to satisfy the crowd, he releases Barabbas and has Jesus to be taken out and scourged. And that's what his soldiers do. So right there, 1 to 15, Jesus is teaching us, just learn to take it, accept it. You're not going to stop it. All you're going to do is make it worse. And that's what he shows, right? And you have to have great courage in, 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 in this. The second one's even worse. 
Now you have to endure it. And the word endure means to suffer patiently, to suffer. Now the soldiers take him away into the praetorium after he's been scourged. And during his scourging, he doesn't cry out. So the soldiers are not going to let this little Jewish man show them that he's better than them because he didn't cry when he was scourged. So we're going to treat him. So they take him back. They mock him, dress him in purple, give him the crown of thorns, give him a reed in his hands. And then they mock by acclaiming him, hail king of the Jews. And they started beating him with the reed, driving the thorns, his crown of thorns into his head. Now, if that isn't in suffering and if that isn't enduring, I don't know what is. And then in verse 20, after they mocked him, they took the purple robe away, put on his own garments, led him out to crucify him. Yeah. What do you have to do when mocking happens? You have to endure it. Patiently endure it. Now, this is kind of interesting. I want to throw this in. Verse 21, they press into service. Pressing into service takes us back to Matthew chapter, someplace in Matthew, I think it's chapter 5, where he says, if they make you walk one mile, that's the Romans, because they could make you walk one mile and carry their armor. Walk two, right? So here they're pressing into service. And you may think, it, you know, ah, oh man, Jesus walked too. Why? Because there's something good that can come from it. You can teach them something. What good comes from, from Simon of Cyrene having to carry the crossbar? It's not the whole cross. It's just the, I think it's, uh, I can't remember. I think it's the pal palatibum. The stipes is the straight up. It always stayed on the hill. The palatibum weighed 75 to 100 pounds. You would, you would be tied to it. Jesus couldn't carry it because it, he was already scourged and beaten. He was not only beaten by hair, he was always beaten by Pilate's guys. He was beaten by uh, the, the temple guard at the end of chapter uh, 14. And he was also beaten by Herod's guard when you look at uh, Luke. So he's taking a pounding. He can't carry the cross anymore. But they press into carrying the cross. Simon of Cyrene. And the neat thing about this is, and I've always overlooked this, it says the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, why does he throw that in? Because Simon of Cyrene steps up and he goes the extra mile carrying Jesus' cross. And what happened? It convicted Simon of Cyrene. It convicted him so much that both his sons became Christians through what he suffered. And you can see Alexander mentioned over in Romans chapter 16. I couldn't find Rufus anywhere. But it's, it's interesting through this. There's a blessing here for uh, Simon. And then they take him down and they crucify him. It's the third hour. And then what do we see? We see three groups of people. And the third thing that Jesus is teaching us here is, you got to accept tall to, you got to accept mockery you got to endure it when they're starting to, to hurt you and then finally you you, you got to ignore it just ignore it ignore means refuse to acknowledge and that's what he does from the cross and three different groups those passing by verse 29 hurling abuse you you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it ha save yourself come down from the cross then here comes the chief priests, and you know the high priest is in there. They were mocking him, saying, you know, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this king of Israel. That's kind of interesting. They don't say king of the Jews. King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we can believe. And then the third group, which was the two, both the robbers on either side, not the thieves, the robbers. These guys were nasty people that were crucified with him were also insulting him so he's you know even the guys i'm that you know i'm dying with on either side are totally insulting me what do i got to do i got to ignore it right and that is his example of what courage Courage will get you out of this thing called mockery. 
and God steps in. And to me, this is why God turned the sun off. Stars came out because it was high noon. There was no, don't go with the movie. There was no rain clouds. There was no lightning and thunder and, arr, and all this darkness. No, there was a bright sun straight up and then God turned it off. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Actually, when you think about it, this is the second time this happened because God did it when? Back in Moses' time. And that darkness lasted for three days on the whole land of Egypt. A darkness that says, you know, a darkness where they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. The only light was in Goshen. Here's God turning the sun off. And when he turned that sun off, the, the, the amazing thing here is those that were mocking, they shut down. You've really got to capture this. They, they, that shut them right down. They're making fun of the son of God. They're, they've done the, their worst. And as he hung there for three hours, they just tormented him. And now all of a sudden, high noon and the sun's gone. You know, it's a big oops. You know, they didn't say another word. For those next three hours as he hung there, there was total silence. Until the ninth hour, when he finally says, my God, my God, why, has you, why have you forsaken me? God hasn't forsaken Christ. Christ took on the sins of the world and that put a separation between him and God. But that shows us what? It shows us the humanity of Christ. He died a death that we rightly deserve to be outside of the presence of God because of our sins. But he took our sins so that we won't experience what he's experiencing. And that was the one big thing he didn't want, especially I think is what his, his struggle was in the garden. His whole life is always with God. And now we don't have to worry about that. Incredible courage. And the veil of the temple is torn in two. The centurion says, well, he has to be the son of God. And then the women were there from a distance. And the example, I did all this looking up in Joshua. And then, it, then I'm looking at the example. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was waiting for the kingdom of God. Now catch this, Joseph was there when Pilate was asking those questions. Joseph was there when they were conspiring to take him over to Pilate. He probably wasn't, definitely. By, by his actions here was not in agreement with all of this mocking but he was part of the crowd once you get into a crowd you can't change the crowd and and he's just being swept with the crowd right but he's had enough of this mocking and he knows who christ really is and so what does he do i i love this he gathered up courage whoa what does he say? Be courageous. He gathered up courage. And what does he do? Goes to Pilate and asks for the body. Because he knows if I take that body down, if I put that body in my own tomb, you know I'm getting fired. You know I am going to be totally ostracized by the crowd. They'll destroy my life. But I'm not going to run with the lies. I'm not going to run with mocking my Lord and Savior. He's Christ is the truth, and I've had enough. I need to have the courage. If you want to be successful, if you want to accomplish things with your life, you got to get the courage. This is what love is based on to say the things that need to be said. And he goes to Pilate and asks for the body. Learning that the Jesus is dead, he goes off, buys a linen cloth, takes takes Jesus down, wraps him, puts him in his own tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And I was always wondering, what about hewn out of the, well, it's in a rock cave. So there's no other entrance, but the one, and he rolls the rock and Mary Magdalene and the mother of Jose are looking on. Be courageous, wrap it up. 13, 14 and 15 fits perfectly. I believe, with Joshua, where he says, 
you you get this word of god into your head and you think about it and you proclaim it each and every day if you want to be a success joshua and you take you be strong and you be what you be courageous these are the three things that god told joshua if you want to make it in this world then that's what you need to have and what is jesus teaching us right here his last three teachings to the church is you need to be a disciple mark chapter 13 don't be apathetic don't follow the way of, of satan don't think you're better than anybody else you're not you need to be a servant so be a disciple and be alert get into this word because this word is going to get you through this life and then the second thing have humility which means be strong because you're only strong when you're humble if you're arrogant you are so weak you're going to collapse right you see satan he's full of arrogance but he's done for and we see that and arrogant people nobody has any respect for arrogant people oh maybe when they're standing in front of you and you just hope they go away but if you really want to be strong be humble mark chapter 14 and then finally today what's he talking about don't be a mocker because that kills your love if you want to be strong with love if you want to be a person be courageous because courage is saying what needs to be said and only what needs to be said when it needs to be said and you all know this we all struggle with this thing called courage because there's times when we need and we're afraid of, con of confrontation we're, we're afraid of conflict don't be go at it with pure love when you're talking to people be courageous. And that's how I pulled three, 13, 14, and 15 together. And that's the encouragement for us today. Be that disciple, be humble, and be courageous. And God will give you success. You don't get success. God gives it. And that's what Jesus is encouraging us, the church, with his last three teachings before he leaves this place. Thank you for listening.